Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for April the 15th of 2020. Of course, my name is Samuel Adams and this is a daily gaming news podcast meant to bring you the hottest gaming news you need to know from around the industry. Hosted on YouTube and podcast services around the world five days a week, it's your one-stop shop for all of the hottest gaming news that you need to know. And today we have quite a bit of news to dive into because we saw some crazy stuff happening on Twitter today. On top of that, we have talked about Call of Duty, Valorant, World of Warcraft, Gamescom, and more. But first and foremost, a new GTA is in development. And on top of that, Rockstar is reportedly making changes to fix crunch culture. Rockstar Games is working on a new Grand Theft Auto, but the next entry in the series is reportedly a long ways from release and may take on a different scope due to alleged changes at the Red Dead and GTA studio. An anonymous source close to Rockstar Games has confirmed to IGN that the Red Dead Redemption 2 company is next working on a new entry in the Grand Theft Auto series, as first reported by Kotaku. Kotaku's report, which places a larger focus on workplace changes allegedly happening at Rockstar following the massive discussions on crunch and game development that centered around Red Dead Redemption 2, also notes, however, that the next GTA is early in development. The report further goes on to explain that, due to the changing nature of conditions at Rockstar, the company is considering ways of altering production to avoid similar crunch issues. One such plan is to allegedly have the next GTA, whether it be called GTA 6 or some other title, be quote, a moderately sized release, which by Rockstar standards would still be a large game, that is then expanded with regular updates over time, which may help mitigate stress and crunch. Of course, given that the next Grand Theft Auto is early in development, it remains to be seen how the later parts of development could affect these plans to curb crunch. The process by which developers work frequent over time in order to hit certain release dates and milestones. According to the new report, Rockstar has attempted to root out the causes of widespread crunch reported at the studio, including changes in leadership throughout many of its offices, outside management training, and plans to improve technology pipelines and scheduling for production on the next game. And while there is still concern at the studio, according to the report, many anonymous devs speaking to Kotaku were cautiously optimistic about the future. IGN has reached out to Rockstar for official comment on the alleged changes at the studio, and as well as further comment on the next GTA, and will update the story should they get a response. Of course, conversation around Rockstar and the effects of Crunch ignited after Rockstar co-founder Dan Hauser, who has since left the company, commented about working 100-hour weeks on Red Dead 2. Though Hauser later clarified his statement was about his specific writing team, discussion around Crunch at the studio surged. Rockstar employees were speaking openly about their experiences at the studio, while reports surfaced that, in response to all the discussion, Rockstar explicitly told employees overtime was not mandated. Crunch and its impact on developers has of course been a discussion before Red Dead 2's development and one we have seen continue since, including a CD Projekt Red executive indicating Crunch would be needed on Cyberpunk 2077 and recent reports suggesting that The Last of Us 2's delay from February to May allegedly led to more sustained crunch rather than alleviating it. So the conversation continues, this is something we've been talking about here on the show for quite some time. And it doesn't seem like there are definitive solutions as of right now. It is good to hear that Rockstar is going to be changing their approach to game development to better handle and better cope with the stress of a game. Uh, But at the same time, this is nothing that is concrete yet. Uh, Of course, this is something that is going to potentially revolutionize the way the games are developed within Rockstar. Uh, But I worry about how the public is going to receive the final product because... Unfortunately, in today's gaming industry, when it comes to sequels, many people expect the next big game to be bigger and better than the one before it, and to some degree, that's kind of justifiable. You should expect the sequel to do more and be more. But whenever you think about a game as as amazing, as incredible, as vast as Grand Theft Auto V, to imagine a Grand Theft Auto VI that is even larger and more in-depth uh, and more varied, that's something that is certainly going to be difficult to undertake. Now, that's not to say Rockstar can't do it, but that is something that can be assumed under the prior way of development. If you are trying to make a better work-life balance for your team, if you are trying to revolutionize the way you develop games, it does stand to reason that you might have a couple of bumps in the road. 
Now, the big question here is, what is the next Grand Theft Auto going to be like? I have heard rumors that it's going to be very online heavy. Uh, on top of that, that would make a lot of sense. But if you do lay down a solid foundation and you continually build on it, perhaps week after week or month after month, uh, with very frequent updates, then that's something that could uh, change the perspective out of the gate, but potentially win a lot of fans over in the long run. There's a lot to digest here, but ultimately I think that Rockstar making changes is something that is a good move in the right direction and you never know if you don't try. I think that really is the big takeaway from this. Even if this does fall flat and if the games suffer because of it and if uh, potentially it makes even more crunch at some other point in the development process, you will know that you tried. You will know that you made an attempt and going forward, you can take what you learned, you can take these failures and you can reevaluate your approach to the entire situation as you try new and diverse ideas. However, we had another big story that broke today. Of course, PS4 exclusives listed for Amazon, or excuse me, listed for PC on Amazon are an error. This is something I talked about in depth on Twitter as the news broke, and of course it got a lot of traction, shockingly enough, much appreciated for those that might have followed because of that, thank you very much. Uh, but earlier today, listing for several games, including PlayStation 4 exclusives, were listed for PC on a French Amazon page. Sony has confirmed to IGN that the listing is not accurate. A series of listings on Amazon France seemingly suggested exclusive PlayStation 4 games like Days Gone and Bloodborne were coming to the PC. However, Sony responded to a request from IGN that, quote, the listings are not accurate and we have made no announcements to bring these games to PC. The listings garnered interest because recently Sony has made some overtures to the PC market by bringing the PS4 exclusive Horizon Zero Dawn to PC. But Sony also clarified that this would be a case-by-case -case situation and not an announcement that all PS4 games will eventually come to PC. Other titles that are not from Sony but are console exclusives like Persona 5 were also listed on PC on Amazon France, but a Sega representative has told IGN that the listing was also an error. When Horizon Zero Dawn was announced for PC, PlayStation Worldwide Studios boss and former managing director of Guerrilla Games, Herman Hulse, said, and to maybe put a few minds at ease, releasing one first-party AAA title to PC does not necessarily mean that every game will now come to PC. In my mind, Horizon Zero Dawn was just a great fit in this particular instance. Hulse added, we don't have any plans for day and date PC releases and we remain 100% committed to dedicated hardware. So this is something that blew a lot of people's minds. Uh, on top of stuff like Days Gone and Bloodborne, you saw the Uncharted Nathan Drake collection. You saw the PlayStation 5 itself listed as something that was going to be coming to PC. On top of that, uh, you saw stuff like The Last of Us 2 also listed on PC. And it was quite the show, let me tell you. A lot of people are very defensive of console exclusives. A lot of people think that PlayStation games should remain on PlayStations. Personally, I think that it would be wise for Sony to see the reaction that they got today and say, hey, why don't we make that happen? Because right now, I think a lot of people would be absolutely on board with having games like uh, God of War on PC, having games like the Uncharted Collection on PC, quite frankly, because Xbox is doing that exact same thing. It makes sense to go on PC because although you still have your console exclusivity in terms of the small little console war that we continue to fight over year after year, PC players can still get all the experiences they need and build a trust and build a love for the PlayStation brands. And I think that definitely brings a lot of value. Uh, but I did want to follow up and mention that if you were following along on my Twitter thread today or those from Nebelion or Wario64, those listings for various PlayStation 4 exclusives on PC are not in fact valid. Uh, as much as you might wish to see Days Gone on PC or other PlayStation 4 exclusives. Of course, it's worth mentioning Death Stranding is going to be coming to PC on top of the aforementioned Horizon Zero Dawn, so these are not out of the question, but it is interesting to see more and more people begin to talk about bringing these games to the PC space. An interesting story to follow that, Infinity Ward developer confirms the first teaser for Warzone was in Modern Warfare's reveal trailer. Infinity Ward developer has confirmed on Twitter that the first teaser and hint at Warzone was shown back in May 2019 when the first trailer for Call of Duty Modern Warfare released. The portion of the trailer which shows the scene starting at the 50 second mark in the video of course is of the individuals jumping off of the plane right here uh, and potentially this was maybe an early mock-up of the first chunk of Warzone gameplay uh, but 
Here are a few images from the moment, which was actually not in the campaign if you did play through it, and I would highly recommend that you do play through it. But Call of Duty Warzone was only officially announced and confirmed on the 9th of March of 2020, when the company announced it was releasing free-to-play on all platforms. Of course, the game itself launched on October 25th, 2019, and it is phenomenal. Big fan of last year's Modern Warfare. But I thought it was interesting that uh, you see these teases that came out that no one really thought were actual legitimate teases. I never would have guessed that would lead to a battle royale, although you could definitely read into it and say, hey, that kind of does make a lot of sense. It definitely did have that battle royale kind of aesthetic. But I will say, if you have not played Warzone, very big game. Of course, I believe we have passed 50 million players at this point, maybe even more than that. And of course, more to come over the course of the next few months as social distancing continues. And guess what? More and more people play video games. But you might be playing Valorant if you have been lucky enough to get into the closed beta. But Valorant tournaments will have to censor the blood. Headshots will result in sparks instead. On Wednesday afternoon, Riot provided its first full update to the community on how Valorant esports are going to work. Rather than running official tournaments or a league, Riot will instead partner with third parties to create tournaments and events. But the developer still has a few specific rules. For the tournament, that was a weird way to say tournament organizers, including that blood effects have to be turned off during the tournament. Inside Riot's official tournament rules for organizers, there is a section about broadcasting the aim. One of the bullet points in the section says that the show blood option from the in-game menu has to be set to off. This does not change anything about the game other than the fact that sparks explode from players when they are shot instead of blood. For most standard large-scale tournaments, this option will only need to be enabled for the observers in each game. But if a tournament is streaming different perspectives or using footage from a streamer's first-person view, then every streamer will have to have blood disabled as well. While at first glance, blood may not seem like a big deal, it can make a big difference to advertisers who have content guidelines. Turning off blood during events can help make the game more attractive as a potential partner since it won't have to be so objectionable content, apart from the massive amount of shooting. Aside from just the rules on in-game blood, Riot has a few other regulations for broadcasters to follow as well. For instance, it is a requirement for all broadcasted tournaments to moderate the chat and prevent vulgar, abusive, or otherwise mean-spirited environments. Riot also includes a list of prohibited forms of advertising, which include things like other games, alcohol or tobacco products, gambling, and firearms. As long as tournament organizers stay within these regulations, anyone can host a Valorant tournament. While individuals and smaller tournaments do not need to register with Riot at all, larger events and international tournament organizers will have to partner with the developer for their events. Now, for a lot of people, you might say, oh my gosh, is it really that big of a deal to have blood on the screen? To some advertisers, yes, and I think it's a wise move because you see this shift over the course of the past few weeks with the world of legitimate, uh, real, in-person sports beginning to crumble under the weight of the coronavirus pandemic. Esports are rising from the ashes, and you see more and more virtual events being held on platforms like ESPN, very big, notable sports networks. Networks? Next. Networks, there we go, can't get it out. Uh, Networks are getting behind esports, and I think that to be able to turn off blood uh, increases their willingness to adopt this new form of entertainment, and of course it increases the engagement from advertisers as well. So Valorant tournaments will have no blood, but they will still have all the action of a regular event. Now let's move on. This is a tweet from Gamescom and it is now official. I wanted to update you guys. We talked a couple of weeks back about the fact that Gamescom was likely going to be canceled because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but now we have official confirmation that even though not all details are known at present, the nationwide ban in Germany on major events until the end of August will also affect the planning for Gamescom 2020. Furthermore, Gamescom 2020 will definitely take place digitally and we will provide further information shortly. This is something that's a bit of a bummer for a lot of people because of the fact that it's one of the biggest gaming events in the world. In fact, it is the biggest. It attracts hundreds of thousands of people to Cologne, Germany, and it is, uh, by all means, something of an industry summit. It is what E3 wishes it was going to be. But it is understandable with the current state of affairs uh, that they are not going to be holding an in-person event. And I think that right now, in terms of Gamescom, uh, there is a large potential for this to be the proving ground for what digital events can do. Of course, IGN Summer of Gaming is coming up. I'm expecting that to be a bit of a smaller scale uh, kind of presentation. I would expect a Kind of Funny Games showcase as well from Greg Miller and the team at Kind of Funny. But Gamescom has resources that these two individual studios simply don't have. 
I think the Gamescom could do something very impressive digitally, depending on how hard they want to go in the paint. But we will have to wait until August to see. Very excited to see what the team behind the scenes does under pressure. Now, this is a cool story. World of Warcraft Shadowlands will support the Xbox Adaptive Controller and other gamepads. WoW's next big expansion is Shadowlands, set in the realms of the afterlife. The Horde and the Alliance will set aside their faction war and chase a new evil known only as the Jailer, who has usurped the natural order of life and death. The game is currently in closed alpha testing and seems truly awesome thus far. A preview on that is coming soon from the guys at Windows Central. One thing that has always been remarkable to me, the author says, and WoW is how it brings players together from all sides of life to meet with common goals. I have been playing the game for nearly 15 years and have played with gamers with all sorts of accessibility needs. I distinctly remember raiding Serpent Shrine Cavern back in the day with an amputee friend Paladin who healed an entire raid of 25 players using a mouse equipped with dozens of buttons. He also competed at a high level in World of Warcraft Arena as well as an able-bodied player I have seen. Of course though, many disabled players have unique challenges that require even more specialized equipment. The open nature of PC makes gaining access to these tools a little easier than it is on a closed platform like console, but Blizzard is making it easier still with Shadowlands later this year, which is now testing full-blown controller support complete with the Xbox Adaptive Controller in mind. Nikki Crenshaw, who works on the UX research with Blizzard, noted to us that accessibility has been driving, uh, excuse me, a driving factor for bringing native gamepad support to World of Warcraft. Quote, we always want to make WoW more widely accessible if possible, so in Shadowlands we are attempting to add some support for keybinds, camera, and turning a character on controllers such as the Xbox Adaptive Controller. I have seen for myself how transformative the Xbox Adaptive Controller can be and have written previously how its modular design can completely streamline the entire gaming process for those with disabilities. World of Warcraft does have a few add-ons that allow for gamepad support, but they can be complex and tricky to set up and maintain. Native support will go a long way to improving accessibility for the game for those who cannot use a keyboard or mouse, and of course the game itself, Shadowlands, is aiming to launch later this year sometime in 2020. Very cool piece of news here. Uh, now of course I'm somebody who is able-bodied, I have no ailments whatsoever, I have no disabilities, I am perfectly capable of playing games, but that's not to say that applies to everybody, and so whether it's something like uh, you know, uh, a Call of Duty game or whether it's something like this with World of Warcraft or anything in between, to be able to have accessibility options is certainly something that doesn't hurt anybody, but helps those who need it. And this is a good piece of content to be adding to your game. So kudos to the team at Blizzard. And I uh, always have a strange relationship with World of Warcraft because it seems to me that I never play it and I don't like playing it, but man, I love watching it. I will watch it for hours on end. Inevitably, whenever the game launches, I will watch Tally. I will watch somebody else on Twitch streaming the game. I'm just a big fan of watching it. But unfortunately, we are rounding off on a sad story today, but one that is uh, a bit of a, a how, how should I say it, melancholy kind of story because there is some good, some bad. An individual who had a very long life has passed away from the coronavirus. Rick May of Team Fortress 2 Soldier and Peppy Hair Voice fame has in fact passed on. The Rekindle School, an independent theater and art school in Seattle, Washington, reported that one of its faculty, Rick May, has died from complications with COVID-19. May, a stage actor, was also the voice of popular video game characters like Pepe Hare in Star Fox 64 and Soldier in Team Fortress 2. May was 79. Peppy Hare may not have been one of gaming's most famous characters, but May's line in 1997 Star Fox 64, where he played Fox McCloud's mentor, is one of the most iconic lines in gaming history. So much so that even Google got in on the beloved meme. So go ahead, Google, do a barrel roll and see what happens. May was primarily a theater actor. He served as artistic director of Renton Civic Theater and Civic Light Opera in Washington State, where he also worked as a freelance actor and director. Throughout his career, he portrayed famous characters such as Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, and Scrooge in A Christmas Character. A character, excuse me, A Christmas Carol. May also played historic figures like Ben Franklin, King Henry II, Julius Caesar, and Theodore Roosevelt in a one-man play, Bully. Whether it was a Shakespearean leader or down-on-their-luck salesman, May seemed almost comfortable exploring the range of masculine roles. In 1997, May began voice acting, and he brought the range he showcased on stage to video games. Although he is only credited with six video game roles, his most famous characters are instantly recognizable. Peppy Hare and Andros in Star Fox 64 and Soldier in Team Fortress 2 in its famous animated shorts, a broad showcase for May's talents as an actor. 
Following his appearance in Star Fox 64, May appeared in games like Pajama Sam 2 as Wingnut, Freddy Fish 5 as Dadfish, Age of Empires 2 as Genghis Khan, and Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves as the nefarious Dr. M. All of the developers, from Sucker Punch and Humongous Entertainment to Nintendo, were fixtures of the Washington State game scene where May called home. In 2007, May once again starred in a game that dominated internet culture for years when he voiced the Team Fortress 2 soldier for another Washington-based game company, Valve. His roles as soldier for various Valve shorts were the most recent listed on May's IMDb page, but the role is a surprising showcase that combines expert comedic timing with gruff charisma. A fitting role for an actor who played a variety of charismatic soldiers on stage. So, very unfortunate death from COVID-19, from the coronavirus, uh, but I wanted to bring it up because Rick May inevitably had an impact on the gaming space, uh, and to see him play so many iconic roles, specifically, of course, Soldier, but in my own childhood, uh, the role in Sly Cooper, that's such a huge piece of my life. Uh, and so, thank you to Rick May for the work you've done over the years as an actor, as a voice actor, as an icon in the gaming industry. It really is unfortunate uh, to see anybody pass away, no matter their age, especially from complications from the pandemic we now wrestle with. But with that being said, that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. If you enjoyed this one, drop me a like down below and let me know what you think about the show and everything we talked about today. Are you excited about a brand new GTA? How do you feel about those PlayStation 4 exclusives being teased and then pulled from our grasp? I would love to hear your thoughts on everything we covered. But until tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic rest of your night. I'll talk to you soon and peace.